Welcome. I'm happy you joined us today for our lecture for week 10. Wow. Who could believe we've been going so quickly through the class? So yes, we're at week 10, and we're going to be uh, learning about the Indians who live on the Great Plateau. So we, we will start off with the PowerPoint. Isn't that girl cute? <laughs> I think she's great. Well, let's take a look at the study guide. When you um, when you use your study guide this week, be sure to have it in hand while you watch the Badger Creek movie. That's a hint. There's, of course, the whole PowerPoint is full of hints about how to do well on the quiz. But in particular, uh, regarding, you know, watching this Badger Creek video. So here's the week 10 uh, study guide. As usual, I've given you some extra hints, and there's quite a few of them uh, in yellow with blue font. Uh, as well as the other items that are listed, which are good to learn. And then down here for Badger Creek, you'll see there's uh, four different yellow highlighted, eight different things to watch. So as you, it's pretty easy as you're watching the film, just glance back and forth between your study guide. And if you think you need help remembering, then take notes on it. Then you'll be in great shape. Going back to our PowerPoint. Well, what where is the area that we're talking about? So right now, here's a map of the Western states and it show, and Canada, and it shows this plateau right here. It's um, a land area that's higher than the rest of the land. It's like a table, it's raised up and it's got the Rocky Mountains and the on, on the Eastern side, the Cascade Mountains. Uh, and it's an area that has a lot of lakes and rivers and forests so that um, the native people who live there uh, we're able to have a good place to live, but in the winter, it can be pretty cold. And in the summer, it can be pretty warm for those of you who've been up in that uh, part of the country. Parts of the, the plateau uh, area include Idaho, California, Montana, Washington State, Oregon, a little bit of British Columbia. And again, I mentioned to you as far as the Cascades on the west, Blue Mountains on the south, which I don't know that I've ever been to the Blue Mountains. It seems like a good place to go look at and see what it looks like. And then the huge Rocky Mountains on the east and north. Food sources traditionally included root crops, uh, as well as other plants that were gathered and different kinds of fish. Lots and lots of fish. A total of over 135 uh, different kinds of plants were gathered and 35 uh, freshwater fish along with, well, not ocean fish because they're up on a plateau, but in the lakes and the rivers, there were a bunch of different kinds of fish to eat. And they could be speared, they could be caught with, you know, angler with a hook and, and caught with nets. Uh, especially if you wait, you can get the salmon that will come up way, way up and be jumping up the little waterfalls and so on. You notice that these people um, are actually modern day people, but they're showing you how they used to dig with sticks to get roots out of the ground. And you probably recall when we were talking about the California Indians, the Yankee gold miners that came called those Indians diggers because they always saw them on the side of the hill digging up roots that they would eat. These native peoples made a mush of the salmon. So they're kind of pounding it and then drying it on these poles that you can see in the picture. And they traded, made and then traded a million pounds of dried fish each year. You can just imagine that's a lot of salmon and it's a lot of good protein and it would taste good. And then you could uh, also of course, reconstitute it, putting it into some sort of a stew or something like that, or just chew on it when you're on a trip. So very important, the salmon runs that brought, and they still are important for the native peoples there. But in the past, there used to be so much salmon because they weren't being fished commercially in the ocean. So You'll probably have remembered a lot of people, Native people in the Southwest, California, pretty much wherever there's a place where there's mountains. In the summers, people go up in the mountains. And uh, as you go up higher elevations, 
the seasons change. So if you were to go right now uh, up to Tahoe, it would be a different season than it is down here in Sonoma County. For example, if you were to go up in the fall, it would already be winter. And when it's early summer here, it's just beginning to be fall or spring up in the mountains. And so the animals also move up and down the mountains, the deer and other animals, birds that come, and different kinds of food that might have not even been growing a few months earlier, as you go later into the season and you go to higher elevations, uh, those foods get ready to eat. Seeds like from uh, pine trees, different kinds of roots and so on. So uh, native peoples would move up and down the elevations. Uh, in the plains, they would move up and down the continent following the buffalo. But in the plateau, they move up and down the higher elevations. And they have different kinds of houses depending on where they're staying and, and where they're moving. So in the summer, it can be pretty hot, even in higher elevations. So having something that looks like a teepee uh, could be a great place, but you might not want to be in a teepee in the winter because it could get pretty cold. You couldn't really marry anybody who was your relative um, if you were a plateau, one of the plateau tribes. And usually the parents would arrange marriages, but normally the couple would agree that they did want to get married. There's a little hint here. It says women were not bought by giving cows to her family. No, uh, they might have had some reciprocal exchange of presents, but there are parts of the world, even now, where women do get traded by their families and they get, because of the loss of the woman to the to her family or loss of a girl, uh, they'll be compensated by uh, the groom's family, who will his extended family that will give them cows. But just to clarify, the Pueblo people did not do that. <laughs> just in case you get a question about that. Uh, once the horses arrived, uh, they were very helpful, but you know, there was more well warfare. So you could travel as a group to another tribe and you could attack them. Of course, you could also attack any settlers when they finally started coming across the Oregon Trail and so on and try to take things that you thought were good to keep. Uh, you could do revenge killings. You could capture people and make them into slaves. Uh, so there was more warfare once the horses arrived. That's the one disadvantage. The advantage is it's a whole lot easier moving your family up and down those mountains we were talking about. And you could travel much faster and it was easier to trade with other people because you could take all this million pounds of salmon and some of it could be carried on horses to other tribes that don't have salmon, but they want it and they'll trade you for what they have. There were some conflicts. There were conflicts within Pueblo communities because certain people became uh, a little bit better at trading and had more influential. Maybe they learned some of the trader languages uh, and they uh, were able to get goods that other people would want and that would increase their status. So pretty much the same as most societies. There are people who are better at business and sometimes those people try to monopolize the trade if they can. You've heard about the... Um, ghost dance religion. Uh, there were also ceremonies for the prophet dance, seven dun, dun, drum, sorry, the seven drum religion uh, appealed to people. Uh, these religions that came about in the late 1800s made people, native people feel like they had some hope and that maybe they could have some control again because what had happened is for 50 years or more, uh, they had become more and more destitute. Their land had been taken. Uh, their people had been dying from disease. And uh, now the U.S. Army was coming through the area and um, would sometimes very brutally uh, control the tribes, um, sometimes march them from one place to another, and a lot of people would die. So these religions gave people hope, but it also made um, the uh, American missionaries, military people, and Others, officials get nervous because what are those people doing over there? Are they going to rebel against us? Today, 
um, Pueblo people, not Pueblo, sorry, Plateau people, um, as in many, many other reservations, uh, are not doing very well economically. And the poverty rate within on the reservations is two to three times as much as it is in the region in general. So uh, the tribes and uh, the state governments, US government, educational groups, they're all interested in seeing how can we uh, get better education and better job training and get more jobs out to where the reservations are. Because a pretty common problem is that most reservations in the US are not near where the jobs are. They're, they, they're isolated areas that um, uh, the Americans of all races did not want to have. They, so they gave, they let say to the native people, okay, well, you can have this part that's sort of left over. And then we're gonna build a nice new city over here on the river or along the ocean. And we're gonna create a lot of jobs there, but you can, you can stay out there on the reservation if you want to. So to stay, you know, to stay with their family, to stay with their culture, they may stay on the reservation, but then uh, not have a very good economic future. So we're, you know, we're hoping that that, that can improve. So this week, we're going to have a video by the Yakima elder who is going to talk to us a little bit about maybe telling us a story to um, about water and what does water mean. So here we go to this. Our feasts start with water. Start with them. the first foods is uh, salmon and deer and roots and berries and back to water again. And that's kind of been our one of our formulas that we've uh, had that uh, you take care of these gifts from the creator and uh, they'll take care of you. They would come home with dried fish, dried deer meat, all kinds of roots and berries. And they would, uh, had all this food, and, and either, even though they had all this food, they would don't take in people or relatives who who were, didn't have a home, and um, and they lived on, on this way all their lives, and it was uh, beautiful. We had an amazing system of clouds and rain, and I think we understood every kind of water there was in our universe, whether it flowed on the ground or whether it came from the sky. And we always had a way to deal with that as a life process. So we understood every molecule as it came from the sky and we knew how to live in it. And there was a place called McCoy Creek. It's all dried up now, great big stream, beautiful holes for fish where the trees used to fall into the creek bottom and it would dam it up and these big pools would form, which was what we used to have on Umatilla on my reservation. Now they keep the river all cleared out of all debris and you don't find those pools anymore. I don't I don't know what fish is like. I don't fish anymore. I don't, and I'd start dying out fishing when I was still on the reservation because they were just, they, those pools were just no longer there. But that McCoy Creek, man, they were trout you know, a trout a foot long in those creeks were pretty good fish. Fish all day long. We'd eat fish every day. Water is the giver of life. If we don't have any water, we have no life. We need it to uh, cleanse the land, you know, quench the land's thirst. Because the land's thirsty too. It's hard to put it into words, my love for this place. This is where my, all of my old, old people are buried. And when my time on this world ends, that's where I want to be. Because the sound, even though the roar of the river, the free flowing has been limited, but it's still my own land. Those connections, you know, that kind of really intimate connection to your place, I think really changes how you feel about it. And, you know, we're compelled to have people understanding it in that way or looking at our place that way because we really do believe they're going to treat it differently think that has to be the case and you know we want people to even have a sense of ownership in it even though that's our stories I mean it's the stories from the place and it used to be that where you were from is who you are nowadays there's all kinds of different ways to define who you are where you know what you are but the reality is, is for 10,000 years around here what you were or who you were was about where you were born and raised didn't have
have nearly as much to do with your blood as it was the other. And so, in that case, these people that are here and going to be here, we need them to feel that that kind of you know connection to to our home and their home. We have to teach people to uh, slow down and stop and think about it. You know, caring for something caring for yourself, caring about the, your elders and your children and, the, and everything around you, all that lives and everything, caring about it. I care about it. Maybe I can share that with you and uh, maybe you learn about what I care about and why I care about it. And maybe you take that and have some insight and, and put that into the fabric of your life that you can take it. And maybe that there are others that will witness this and take that and put it into their life and, and have an insight and understanding of what it's like to be alive, you know, to care about something. And they can teach themselves and their children and their grandchildren that they too can do this. Okay, so thank you for joining us today. Um, I look forward to seeing you online, and I hope that, you know, that this information that you're learning this semester about all of our wonderful, fascinating, and rich uh, cultures of Native peoples across the United States is, you know, striking a chord for you, uh, and that you'll, you know, remember the parts that you consider to be the most important, and that you'll... Uh, that you'll share this with other people and hopefully that you will visit some of the places uh, that you've been reading and hearing about. All right. Thank you very much.